Welcome to the latest episode of the Project Liberal Show. My name's Josh Eckel. Um, I am your host today all by myself. Jonathan Casey is taking this week off. And I'm joined today by Micah Irfan. I said your name right, Micah. Thank you for yeah, making you didn't. time. All <laughs> I star. Did. I, I did or I didn't? You did. You did. Okay. You did great. Okay. I'm just making sure. I just heard it, so I want to make sure I didn't screw it up. Micah, uh, tell me if I've got your bio wrong. So Micah is um, describes himself as a political organizer and a policy researcher. He's a Democratic delegate for the uh, for the Texas party. Uh, the the, the upcoming... Texas convention. It's coming up soon. Yes. Big deal. Uh, you guys might be changing to blue. That's what they say every year. Um, and I know you're also on the steering committee for the Center for New Liberalism. Am I right? Are you still doing that? Yes, a related organization. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm a steering committee member. Awesome. Okay. So um, just for our audience's sake, the reason I wanted to have a conversation with Micah is because Micah is part of, I think, uh, one of the like more inspired. I, I, you're, you're, you're Gen Z, right? Um, yeah. you're, you are uncharacteristically active in, in, uh, in politics for most people I run into um, among Gen Z. And I think you have... I, I, you know, you, you can fight me if you think this characterization is wrong, but I think that you have online articulated like a, not only a liberal, not a, not in the traditional sense, like a liberal view, like a li liberal political space, but you've yeah. articulated a, like a pro market, a pro growth poli political policy on the left, which I don't know if a lot of people characterize those two things together. And I think there's this really exciting growing coalition of young people that believe in these values, and I think you are probably one of the best spokespeople for that. So I wanted to bring you on, talk to you about your worldview, and maybe get into the weeds on a bunch of different stuff. So yeah, but see, that's that's why I like you so much, Josh. I, I don't feel like there's a lot of people with kind of our ideology and also uh, a stated mission of spreading that ideology. Right? There's a lot of nerds which kind of have our positions. I like to think because we're correct, um, right? There's like a great convergence of libertarians and left wing people towards the same policy views. But most of them are writing substacks that are fantastic. I read them, but don't have general appeal to like normal everyday folks, which don't know what deadweight loss means. Um, yeah. And what I appreciate about you so much is like this is the kind of thing we have to brand and spread to the masses. To the masses, because in reality, it's not complicated. Um, good ideas are not complicated to understand. Uh, we just need people that are willing to try to articulate them. Yeah, and to add to that, so you know that I've spent the last 10 or 15 years now working in the libertarian, classical liberal space. I like to use classical liberal now because the word libertarian is – I'd like to say it's becoming co-opted in the United States in a really bad way. But I digress. In that space, there are a lot of people that, are, that have a very difficult time translating their values to reality. So you can imagine um, the people that spend a lot of time reading, you know, Mises, for example, are very ideological driven. They're very intelligent people. But then when you say, now apply that to this problem, it becomes very difficult. And so, yeah, I agree. I, I think you do a great job of that. And it's difficult to do. I mean, it's, it's important. I think it's logical, but it's, it's difficult to do because it requires you to take some stances that some people may not like. And it's, that's the nature of politics, but it's very important. So I'm glad to have the conversation as well. It's going to be fun. Yeah, I think the major difficulty of our position is um, there's nuance, right? Because, yes. you know, you think the world is a complicated place. Um, and if you look at kind of the biggest ideological movements which have existed today and throughout, uh, you know, political history, it's usually people that have a very simple story of politics because humans love simple stories, right? We know things are messed up and we want a simple explanation for why, that, why it's messed up and how we can fix all of our problems. And so it usually comes down to like scapegoating some sort of group. That's what authoritarians always do, right? Um, it's, you know, some race, it's the immigrants, it's this, it's the deep state, um, it is LGBTQ people, the woke mob, maybe it's the bourgeoisie, right? Every single problem comes from this one group and if we just quash them and we beat them enough with the stick, the candy will come out, everything will be great, all of our problems will be resolved. And the reality is, that's not how the world works. And, and so the bad guys are really good at selling their bad ideas. And so that's why it's all the more important that we sell the good ideas, because there's so many salesmen on the other side. Yes, well said. Okay. And that's a more pressing issue now uh, than I think it's been since probably World War II, because we're witnessing the rise of uh, mainstream uh, authoritarianism, especially on the right, on the far right, and it's not just a fringe group. Um, I'd like to say that in the Democratic Party, they've kind of kept those extremists 
uh, in the minority, uh, in, a, in a pretty significant minority, and it's usually characterized on the left nowadays by, you know, crazy college kids that you see maybe trying to shut down speakers and stuff like that. But I don't see main, I don't see the same mainstream political movement on the left like I do on the right right now, which is fully embracing demagoguery and authoritarianism. So actually, I don't want to. This may seem like I'm going down a rabbit hole, but I promise I'm tying it back to something. Uh, did you have you do you watch uh, uh, Channel Five and All Gas No Breaks guy the Andrew Callahan? Do you know what I'm talking about this YouTube channel? I don't know what you're talking about. No. Okay, so it's a pretty big YouTube channel, but he just he does this like um, this like journal. He does journalism where he just kind of goes to different rallies and different poli- uh, different environments mm-hmm. and talks to people. And you should look it up because he I mean he's grown really fast, but he's a young guy that just does this really hands on journalism. I actually think it's real journalism. He went to Las Vegas. Um, uh, a couple months ago, and he went on a goal to basically humanize the unhoused community in Las Vegas. And I don't know how familiar I learned about this by watching his show, and I've gone into a rabbit hole recently about watching this. There's a huge community of uh, unhoused people and um, mostly you know, drug addicts and things like that that live in the tunnels under Las Vegas. And the reason they live under the tunnels in Las Vegas is because... Las Vegas is a kind of conservative-run city relative to other big metropolitan areas. And being homeless in, um, in Las Vegas is basically a criminal offense. Uh, you'll get fined over and over again. You'll get thrown in prison for effectively loitering. Um, and I, I thought about it for a minute, and it, it does tie back, and it kind of gives us a pivot to the first point that I want to talk about, which is the housing problem. But I was thinking about this the other day in the context of, you know, if you turn on right-wing media, like Tucker Carlson or whatever, they're always showing videos of people in, say, Democratic cities hunched over on the side of the street, unhoused, usually drug-addicted, right, to show that it's a symbol of the collapse of democratic ideas, right? Or it's, it's really a, sure. it's a, it's an attack on liberal values in a lot of ways, but it's really just, an, they're trying to tie it to the democratic party, whatever. Sure. sure. And I realized by watching this and really looking at some of the policies in Las Vegas is, and this is the case everywhere across the country. Um, as you said, populist demagogues, they will use images like that to try to, to try to, you know, characterize one group as bad or the other. And this is not a unique phenomenon to conservative run cities or democratic run cities or unhoused people everywhere. There are drug addicts everywhere. And it's usually due to an underlying problem, which is unaffordable housing or criminal justice system and all the things that we'll talk about on this show. So, um, I couldn't think you're, you're more on point. And that's one of the reasons I'm excited to talk to you a little bit about solutions. So maybe we could talk a bit about the housing crisis. And I promise I'll start to stop talking, but I want to frame it one more, t- a little bit more here. Sure. Um, I think that a lot of the, a lot of the uh, right-wing populism and, and discomfort, especially among Gen Z, is because housing is insanely expensive. If you can't afford to live a life and you can't envision yourself buying a home and settling down and doing the things that your parents did, and you think that's out of reach, you're going to reach for extreme ideas, find someone to blame. Right, so I am curious. Uh, there's this growing movement of people that characterize themselves as Yimbies, Yimbies, and they are fighting effectively on the left for what I would say is market-based policy when it comes to housing. Can you talk to me a little bit about the movement? What got you involved in it, and just kind of like um, maybe some of the, the things that they want to achieve and how they, they plan to achieve it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I, start, I first started getting involved in the Yimby movement probably about three or four years ago when I became aware of how extraordinarily expensive housing was. And also, I became directly acquainted with how different certain cities across the world were from the cities that I had engaged with. You know, I grew up in a suburban town in the south of Houston, and I'd go on trips to Europe. My, you know, my dad is a, uh, a missionary and a minister, and so we would go have conferences with other uh, Iranian expats in other countries, and I'd get to see, like, Germany, and I'd get to see uh, places like uh, Sweden. And I was like, wow, their cities look so different. Why is that the case? Um, obviously, we all go through, down this rabbit hole, and we say, oh, wow. Um, it's because making those kind of cities, the walkable ones, the dense ones, that is illegal. And, um, you know... I'm, I'm a very initiative-based person. Uh, whenever I see a problem, it's like once it becomes my problem, the mission of my life is trying to fix it. Yeah. And so about um, two years ago, I realized there was no housing organizing uh, on changing these bad regulations uh, in the city of Houston. And so I started doing it. I started showing up to housing authority meetings. 
um, planning commission meetings, city council meetings, and the things I heard were exactly the kind of stereotypes that I think people are becoming more familiar with today. The NIMBYs are everywhere. Um, you know, there was a development for elderly housing, literally just redeveloping a building for uh, disabled elderly people. Um, and there was people coming out to these housing authority meetings saying, well, I think they, sh they should have housing somewhere, but if you put it here, there's going to be a little bit of a shadow on my front lawn, or yeah. it's just the wrong location. Um, it's, it's, you know, literally 0.1 miles away from the nearest bus stop. There's no access to the bus stop for them. And um, obviously, you know, I started speaking out against that. I started organizing people for the same purpose. Um, I'm happy to report that the city has actually, the city of Houston has done transformational um, housing regulatory reform in the past, about, about four or five months ago, with my group's support. Um, and so I'm very engaged. I was recently at Gimby Town, and I think that the housing crisis is one of the economic crises of our times. If you look at rising inequality, if you look at stagnation of people's real wage growth, you can tie back all of these problems to the central issue, which is that the government has made housing illegal, specifically affordable housing, and that is impoverishing us all. So it's made it illegal, um, and it, this is not like uh, the government passed a law that said affordable housing is illegal. This is basically due to the systemic nature of how we do permitting, right, and zoning laws effectively. I mean, I, I'm, I don't uh, make uh, say that I'm an expert on YIMBYism, but I do think that those, right, are the two major buckets that I think most YIMBYs try to attack is the permitting structure and zoning. Is yeah, right? so it's like it is really remarkable the number of regulations that exist on the books to prohibit um, the kind of dense housing we perceive as affordable, right? So, like, how do you make a housing? How do you make so, um, housing that's more affordable, right? Well, you use less land, and maybe you have less building, or you're more space efficient or cost efficient. And the most cost efficient developments, the ones that provide you the kind of the best bang for your buck per square foot, are the densest ones. You know, not very much land. Yep. Smaller units, right? Units packed closer together because now you're spending less on cabling, spending less on uh, the walls, right? There's like shared roof and ceilings and, and water piping. All this stuff is way cheaper. And uh, we have regulations like minimum lot sizes, which say, hey, the minimum lot size you can have, the smallest a plot of land could be, is an acre in some places. An mm -hmm. acre, a whole acre. Uh, we have setback requirements. Hey, you can build a building on this uh, plot of land, but it needs to be set back, you know, uh, 50 feet or something like that, right? Um, hey, you can build a, a building on this plot of land, but actually 50% of the land area needs to be reserved for parking spaces, Yeah. right? Uh, height restrictions, density requirements, maximum unit sizes. Then sometimes we have actual zoning, which says it is literally illegal to build an apartment here. You're just not allowed to build it. And when you start adding all these up, you see, oh, my gosh, the only thing that's legal to build in a lot of these areas is a single-family home that has a big lot. And the reality is there's usually way more people who want to live in these areas like San Francisco than there is homes, which means that the prices of those homes skyrocket through the roof. Yeah, and San Francisco is a crazy city to look at on a map because it is there's some density in the city center, but there's an obscene amount of single family homes around that city and they're locked in place, multi million dollar properties. You could take a chunk of that neighborhood, turn it into high density housing, you solve the housing crisis within a matter of months. So this is a uh, a situation that's regulated mostly by cities, yes? It's basically a Absolutely. city okay, city county. So What's interesting about this, and I think this is the most exciting thing, especially for young people, is like when, pe when we think about federal policy, uh, when we think about politics, a lot of people think federal. And um, really, that's the place where you have the least amount of influence because you're fighting with the biggest, the people with the biggest wallets. But like at the local level, you can actually affect real change. As you mentioned, you did this in Houston. Um, so for, you know, like, so uh, what does that entail? If you're, like, trying to move the needle on this, uh, I'd say bring housing closer to being, like, a market-driven situation where supply is met or demand is met with supply, right, which is the problem that we have now. We have too much demand and not enough supply. Um, is it as simple as going to these... Uh, meetings, these local meetings, having conversations? Like, what was the path for you to make some of the uh, change policy-wise that resulted in positive outcomes? <clears throat> so I think that um, the first thing you need to do is definitely just start showing up. There's, a, there's like a limitless number of opportunities for you to get more involved, and very few people do. 
and the people who do are almost exclusively people who completely disagree with us. Um, I like to call it the, the, um, the, the Karen archetype for people. There's both male Karens and female Karens, but yeah. I, I swear to God, if you go to these meetings, um, the average age is 65, and there's almost no standard deviation. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it's just a bunch of, like, you know, old ladies, and I'm sure they're super sweet. They might agree with you on federal politics, but they just hate everything. You know, they hate bike lanes. They hate sidewalks. They hate buses. They hate new, new lanes of new car lanes. They just hate anything that is different than it ever was before. Yeah. And so just showing up and providing your perspective can be very valuable. When I first came to a planning commission meeting, I brought um, four um, young people with me, and we all spoke. And people at the planning commission were shocked. They were so happy that somebody was finally there agreeing with them. Their, their staff reached out to us uh, afterwards. The members of the Builder Association had a private meeting with me afterwards because people were like, wow, there's young people who have this kind of view. This is truly important. Um, city council members are often trying to make decisions based on what their constituents say. That's their mindset. I represent my constituents. And when all of their constituents are saying, don't listen to the planning department, don't mm -hmm. listen to all these you know, good policy ideas, it's going to destroy everything. They don't feel like they have the proper mandate. Like, it's, um, like they are able uh, to vote for a lot of the good changes that need to be made. And yeah. so getting involved is very important. But the one thing I would say is don't come there being all preachy. Uh, a lot of these people that, that are sitting on these committees and our city council members have been around in the community for a long time, and they don't respect people who just came around and attacking them, telling them they need to act differently. It needs to be very agreeable, very nice, very kind, and the more you get to know these people, the more you can maybe be a little bit more honest. <laughs> I, I do like it. I mean, that, that does make a lot of sense. These... Um... It's effect, and it, it, there's actually something I think that's really like galvanizing about the whole concept because you've got it is it's kind of an it is kind of an age fight, right? Because a lot of the people that have the property uh, that are there are going to, and the people that have the time, frankly, to be at a city council meeting all the time are going to be older property owners that want to conserve that everything in their community. But the people that are really suffering the most are a much bigger category. It's people that are young that maybe don't have a lot of assets that are starting their life, that have the most to gain by development and growth. Um, and actually, I, I've seen so much progress in this movement on the left. I, I, it's not even on the left, it's just in general. It's actually a, kind of a bipartisan thing in many cases. Um, that I, I do feel like this could be a really big youth movement. I think it will be in the next couple of years, especially if people like you continue to fight for this stuff. So this is incredibly exciting. Um, what is a parking minimum for everyone's? You mentioned this earlier. What, what, so I've heard about this a lot, and I, I know that there's these minimum requirements. Why, does par, why do parking minimums, and how do those things affect uh, housing prices? Well, they they destroy sense? cities. Um, and, and if you want to see um, how, I would just look at the work of the Parking Reform Network, and I'd also just look at like parking mandates before and after, or look at old pictures of your city, and then look at pictures like 20 years later. Um, so like you know, the 1930s, and then look at like 1960. Because um, you will see, you'll have these bustling downtowns, we'll have streetcars everywhere. It's like, wow, this looks like Europe. And then 30 years later, half of it's leveled, all of it's parking lots, there is no transit anymore. And that is because um, whenever the automobile was uh, coming about, um, there, was a, there was an issue because there was no parking to accommodate all of these new vehicles. So people were, it was crazy, it was chaotic. People were just leaving their car in the street to go into the supermarket. And when everyone's driving now, now you have a street that's just clogged up with cars that are parked and nobody can get where they need to go. And so the government was confronted with basically two options. One, produce like designated parking spaces on the street or um, in parking garages, like public parking, or two, offload it onto development. And they said, why don't we just offload it onto development? Why don't we just say that every building had to have a certain number of parking spots? And it's really funny because you would think there'd be some sort of scientific procedure to determining, okay, how many parking spots does this, building, this kind of building need? Not scientific at all, completely, ludicrously arbitrary. Um, some, like, if you look at some of these parking requirements, it will be like, okay, bars should have like 11 parking spots per every 1,000 square feet. Or barbershops should have two parking spots per every chair. Per every chair. Um, like, that's very strange. Yes, it is. And it leads, first, it leads to an enormous overproduction of parking, which means an underproduction of everything else. Parking takes land. 
and parking costs money. So the more parking we have, the less we have of everything else. I like to use this example. Imagine if we required um, every person who wanted to build a car uh, to also produce 15 backpacks, right? What would that do to the price of cars? And right. like provide those backpacks to you, f to you for free, right? Yeah. That, that would probably just like make cars more expensive, um, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. So like that's, that's what we're doing to um, an inordinately higher uh, degree. And one other thing I'd like to note is you don't need to be some sort of urbanist, like everybody should walk, bike, or take trains all the time to understand that parking mandates are bad. Even if you think everybody should drive and, and Hondas are a gift from Jesus Christ himself, um, the, the actual um, structure of the way that we park under parking mandates is inefficient. Um, many times in a free market uh, where the government was not imposing these mandates, you would have the, a, a similar supply of parking, but it would be in one joint lot or one joint garage. And this is because different types of uses of land have different peak occupancy times. So imagine a laundromat right next to a breakfast, um, like a breakfast place, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When is the breakfast place parking lot full? In the mornings. When is the laundromat's parking place full? Probably not in the mornings. Right. If you allow both of these places to have shared parking, well, then you can use less parking spaces, less land and less expense, and still meet everybody's needs. Yes, and I think that is a positive environmental impact because you don't have all this concrete everywhere. It's got a pos It's just aesthetically more pleasing. It's, as you mentioned, it's more walkable. I mean, at least that's a consequence of not having these massive lots that you got to traverse. That's a very interesting dynamic. Um, <clears throat> uh, was, do you know anything about the history of how those came about? I mean, was that a federal incentive, or did, like, everyone converge on those things? I know I didn't prep you for that question, but... So, so well, it's... <clears throat> so, so, don't worry. I mean, I'm doing <laughs> got all in organizing it. parking <laughs> mandate stuff like crazy, right? So this it. is the kind of stuff I read about. I mean, I, I believe it was some city in the north... Um, uh, which basically just, they were confronting this problem and they had this brilliant idea, why don't we just require all new development to have parking mandates? And then like other cities were like, wow, that's like super great because it fixes this problem and I'm sure it has no negative consequences at all. Uh, just like every bad government rule, um, right. it's like, hmm, this like really looks like it makes sense. Wouldn't it be great if we had way more parking and um, we didn't have to pay for it, and there was no, there was no negative side effects. It just so happens to be the case uh, that there are an incredibly large number of negative side effects. So, okay, so it sounds like it was kind of a convergence, um, which that, that would be my assumption, too. You see this kind of stuff trickle out. There is a city, though, in Texas, and I think it's Dallas, right, that um, – and I'm not talking about parking minimums now. I'm more talking about zoning – Dallas is, am I correct on this? Dallas is like one of the most unique zoning systems in the country. So, so Austin eliminated parking mandates recently. Okay, Houston, good. my city, yeah. does not have zoning okay. technically. Okay, so that, I was thinking about Houston, not Dallas. I actually get them too mixed up. Uh, but so what, what, what's been the impact of that? Like, I mean, I've seen some crazy photos coming out because this is, I remember looking at pictures of this and you see like high rises next to these smaller buildings and it's just like, it looks like a really strange dynamic. It's not like any other American city. Um, how did that come about? Like, what do you think the impacts of that have been? Do you think that model should be exported out to the rest of the country? Like just get rid of zoning like that? So I think, um, I think this is why I don't talk about zoning. Everybody has obsessed with zoning. Mm -hmm. Zoning is just one type of regulation. And you can achieve all of the things that zoning does with different regulations, right? So zoning would say, this is the specific kind of thing that can be built here, right? You can only build single family homes here. You know, you can right. have multiple units on a building. But you can achieve the same result with other regulations. You could just say, hey, by the way, there is a unit limit of one. Each building can only have one unit. And there's a height restriction of two stories. Um, and there's a lot size of this amount. And it's like, oh, wow. So we have the same outcome as zoning. Yeah. And so in the city of Houston, we're often praised as being like the free market city, maybe because other cities are completely god awful. <laughs> um, but the reality is um, we have parking mandates out the wazoo. Uh, we have lower minimum lot sizes, but we excluded the rich areas. So the rich areas still totally have the minimum lot sizes. We also have private zoning. It's called private deed restrictions. 
um, you know, these private contracts made between landowners a long time ago that still apply today. And okay. so in many of our rich neighborhoods, about 25% of the land area of our city is under these covenants, which basically say, hey, you can't build um, apartments. Um, also, you're not allowed to let b black people buy things in our neighborhood. Th these are real things that are part of these um, old private deeds. Now, that line is not enforced, but all the other lines are. I see. Um, and what's really remarkable about our system is that we are pretty much the only city, I believe, in the entire world that funds the enforcement of these private contracts. So if somebody doesn't like it, you know, you, you built, you have an ADU in your backyard, there's somebody living, you know, in another unit at your house, the government will pay for your lawsuit against that person in the city of Houston. Um, which is awful. Now, here's the one thing that's important to note, though. In the city of Houston, we have basically achieved two things that are unique and that ha are largely responsible for our more affordable housing. We have townhomes. Townhomes are legal, and we build them like freaking crazy. They're all over the place. Um, and the second thing is we, we don't have, like, commercial and residential districts. We do have regulations which quasi recreate that sometimes but if you really want to come into a place that's traditionally residential and you buy up a bunch of properties you can get a mixed use development there where you have an apartment above and some stores on the bottom that's technically that technically can happen mm -hmm. in a place like san francisco no shot <laughs> you're, yeah, you're yeah. toasted very interesting okay <clears throat> well then let's let's zoom out a little bit these i think this is all very interesting um I want to zoom out, though, because so this whole conversation basically touches on, as we talked about at the beginning, how to return effectively market forces to fix the supply and demand problem and basically reduce restrictions in order to incentivize growth. There is a big – I feel like it's a growing schism on the left around this concept of growth versus degrowth. I mean it plays out, sure, in housing, although I hear the growth people are a lot louder in housing. But the, it feels like, for example, with the issue of climate change, which I – is an incredibly important issue. The left, at least the far left, articulate this concept of we need to do less. We need to shut down industries and we need to start recycling our water over and over again. And, you know, like, I mean, come up with a million anecdotes about just like, hey, we need to do less. We need to be maybe it's almost like they I don't know. I mean, it, it's almost like they want to impoverish us more so that we, we use less carbon. Um, and I don't think that it's just related to climate change or housing. I think this is just kind of a broad mindset. So I see the new liberals, which I, you know, it's a category I know that you, you, you carry, really articulating an optimistic, forward-looking view. They say, we can fight these problems. We can fight housing. We can fight even wealth inequality. We can fight um, climate change. But we can do it through growth and through markets. And uh, have you run into some of this infighting? Do you see the same schism? Um, how do you approach that conversation when you're talking to young people? <clears throat> well, I, I think that I probably view the political spectrum in a very similar way that you do. Um, I don't think the division is so much left versus right as it is liberal versus illiberal. Yeah, I agree with uh, that. Because the reality is, like, you, know, you're, you either want an open society or you want a closed one, right? Authoritarian people on the left and right disagree on what they want to be closed to. Yeah. Right. Like, why are we being closed off to automation? You know, why are we being closed off to immigrants? Is it because we hate them because they're brown or because we hate them because they lower wages? Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so they have different justifications, but often for the same ideas. Um, and, and you see that authoritarians are obsessed with this pessimistic view of the world. Everything is always becoming worse. Um, and uh, th it seems like there's a very big motivation of fear um, that they have as well. And so. I think that um, I think in, when it comes to growth, uh, some people view humanity as a disease. Uh, I am not one of those people. Yeah. Um, I, I think that some people have this very zero sum mindset where they think, um, insofar that there's economic problems for people, which everybody recognizes, those economic problems can be rectified just by crushing the group, which is completely winning. Right. And I think a lot of people on the left struggle from this. Uh, descriptive view of the world that is simply not accurate. They think if we simply just tax rich people way more, now everybody would have a perfect economic existence. So perfect, in fact, that we could just reduce our environmental impact by like 90% and everything would be great. And if you just do the math on that, you'll realize, actually, no, uh, we can 
tax you know, Elon Musk to oblivion. We can tax all these people more. Maybe that's even a really good idea. But we're still going to have a lot of people which would benefit from having a higher material standard of living. Yeah. The best way to decarbonize is to lift people out of poverty in a lot of ways because when you're in really extreme forms of poverty, you're, you're, there is an environmental impact to that. And you see this in the third world and in developing countries. Another anecdote, and again, I might get this one wrong, but I was listening to somebody talk about this the other day, and they said if you confiscated the wealth from every uh, super wealthy individual in the United States, it would fund the federal government's operations for like eight months or a year or something like that. If you confiscated everything, not just... Not just fifty percent or sixty percent. Like you took everything in their houses and all. So uh, it is. It is crazy. So um, I do like that framing: liberal versus illiberal. Um, when it comes to when it comes to the growth conversation, um, it, it, do you like what kind of talking points do you focus on to kind of pull people out of that mindset? Because I feel like a lot of young people are stuck in this mindset. And uh, they don't really understand that dynamic. Do you have any stuff that you've used or uh, that you've talked to other young people about? You feel like is a well, winning. Well, so I think that I just like to talk about specific issues, right? So sure. I partake in this whole meta narrative, like broad, big political story thing because I think it's important for movements. And I think if you can, if we can make a simple liberal story, you can start that people can we can convince people of, then they can start pulling all of our policies out of it, right? So like libertarians, their simple story is that the government's bad, right? Yeah. And so all of their policies are just super easy to pitch once you've convince somebody that the government is just bad. Yeah. And so I want our liberal story to be like, hey, individual choice and control is really good, right? And so sometimes that means removing the government's ability to you know, micromanage development, right? Removing the government's ability to impose barriers to uh, achieving certain pr professions. Yeah. Um, but also sometimes that means getting rid of private barriers, right? So like private companies keep uh, people's uh, wages and compensation, private information, right? So if you want to go get a job, let's say as an engineer, um, you often have no reference point about how much engineers at this firm are even paid. And so that reduces your bargaining power, reduces your ability to make decisions that are good for you. And so that's, that's an example of the way that the government can do a new intervention, but it also enhances people in, people's individual choice and freedom. So I think that's useful. Uh, for our movement. But whenever I talk to people on an individual level, the real story I try to tell is about a government that is simply incompetent and ineffective. Because I think everybody's aware of this by now. They know the government's not working, and it's really easy to show many examples of where that's the case. Um, and and I, I think housing is a great example. I think occupational licensing is a great example. I think for young people, education is a phenomenal one. Yeah. You know, why is it the case that when you go to a university, you have to go through these core requirements, which you already had to, these same, these same courses that you already had to take in high school, especially when we know that people's retention rates for information that is not relevant to their daily life is extremely bad. Mm -hmm. If you give somebody a test that has not taken a class, and then you give them that same test uh, once they've taken the class, and then that same test two years after they've taken that class, the first score and the, la and the third score are almost the same. So after two years, your score is almost what it, what it was whenever you never took the class in the first place. You forgot almost everything from the class after two years. Given that information, why are we forcing a generation of people to take at least a year's worth of coursework and pay a huge price for it that is going to be completely useless to their daily life? And one other example. So I'm, I'm on a tirade. No, yeah, go for why it. Why do we require young people to go to get a bachelor's degree before they go to law school or medical school when that's not what's done in the rest of the world and when that's not what was done in this country for about a century. It's because of special interest groups which have captured the government and, and, and incentivized policymakers to do things that are good for themselves politically yep. but bad for the public. So uh, I, I didn't have this on the agenda, but you've, you've triggered a thought with me. Are you, do you consider yourself then um, a fan of like the school choice movement and some of the stuff around that? I mean, I know that one's kind of fraught because the devil's in the details on how that's implemented, but uh, do you find yourself kind of drawn to some of those narratives? So I think that... Um, By the way, I was homeschooled K through 12. Like I never went to public school. So I've got like a little bit of a bias in this conversation, but because uh, I agree with everything you just said. Didn't mean to cut you off. So, <clears throat> well, 
I uh, so my, my as I said, my my father's a minister, um, and so I went to Christian schools. Mine too, uh, by the now, way. Now, I think people have an impression that you know when you go to a private school, it's like some great luxurious academy. I certainly had friends which went to the Catholic schools, which had like a twenty thousand dollar per year per pupil budget and great stuff like that. Those were, those were not my schools. I'm not even close. Um, sometimes our grades did not even have their own textbooks. We had to use the next grade's textbooks. Um, and my experience. Uh, was that teachers were great and people were trying their best, uh, but there was many components of that education which should not be counted as an education that's funded by the taxpayers. Um, taxpayers should not fund the classes that made me memorize scripture. Uh, taxpayers' funding should not go to my chapel services where they made everybody pray and sing songs or made everybody write down prayers and have those prayers graded. And sure. certainly, taxpayer funds should not go um, to classes which were literally their entire purpose was teaching us that evolution was wrong and yep. that, the, that the world is 5,000 or 6,000 years old. That's simply not the, in the public's interest. If people want to teach their kids that, this is a free country and they have the right to do so. But I think that the biggest issue that school vouchers have is they want to dole out public money for an education, but they don't want to define what that education is. And so I think that there's a lot of things that should be done to expand parents' choice between public schools. Um, but, but I also think uh, if we're going to have private schools, independent nonprofits like charters or yep. for-profit schools involved in the system, there needs to be very strong standards so that we make sure that what, we're, what the public is buying here is an actual education that benefits students. So school choice with conditions. It's funny because I, I didn't realize how similar our upbringing was. I also was raised with a very with, by a pastor, very similar uh, educational environment. Evolution's fake. Uh, Earth six thousand years old. The Ark was a literal story. That kind of stuff. And it's funny because it was after the internet that kind of broke me out of that. And as an eighteen year old, I kind of actually was an eighteen. I was like a sixteen year old. Kind of started to navigate my way out of that. But I think that's actually a very compelling narrative. It's like the idea that if you do want to have school choice, there needs to be standards. So we can't have, you know, neo-Nazi classrooms in these small communities or, seg you know, a segregated schools taking public well, funds. I think that's you know, an interesting narrative. The jihadist um, academy, like, should just yeah. not be a publicly funded institution. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, I would say if you want to map up my opinion on the, on the political spectrum, it'd be cl probably closer to charter schools. I mean, I think if you look at some of the best ac academic institutions uh, for primary and secondary education in this country – you're going to see a lot of charter schools and a lot of magnet schools. And these schools work great. I used to work at a charter school, and I understand the value that's given to parents who say, my public school is failing. There's this group of teachers or this nonprofit which has found a good formula for teaching kids. I want to send my kid there. Uh, my issue is mostly with vouchers. This has been the big discourse in our state. Yeah. Uh, the, the desire to take money out of this public, uh, publicly accountable system Put it as a voucher that can go to anything. In Arizona, people have spent their school vouchers, their education savings account money, on blenders. I, I simply don't think that makes any sense. I don't think that these private institutions should be able to discriminate against kids and say, sorry, your application was bad. We just don't want to take you for any reason. You're not mm -hmm. a Christian. We don't want to take you. Yeah. Um, so I think that I, I would. you can consider me pro-charters broadly, yeah. but definitely not pro Vouchers. Not pro voucher. I got you. Interesting. Okay. Well, let's move to another topic because I want you know we try to keep these close to an hour, and I know we got some ground to cover. So let's talk about maybe another subset of the values of maybe the new liberal movement, uh, which is uh, now I'm curious universal basic income. I do want to talk about healthcare as well, but maybe we touch on universal basic income first. Are you a UBI fan? Um, are you like where do you stand on the whole UBI thing? <clears throat> well, well, I think that we want to – so poverty is really bad, and we should probably get rid of it. And it seems like most people actually agree with that. Um, and so we're using – we have about 100 federal welfare programs that are trying to do that, and then you stack on tons of state ones and local ones, and then we have all these nonprofits. Yeah. And, like, we're not solving the problem. Like, we're not even close to solving the problem. There's still tons of poor people all over the place. And so it seems to me that um, – being poor is not having enough money to meet your expenses. That, that's what it's about. Um, and it, there's been a lot of studies on what happens when you give poor people money, and it seems that when you give them money, they just spend it on meeting their expenses, like their, their basic necessities. And so I think a form of basic income would be a very appropriate replacement for a lot of our current messy 
bureaucratic and administrative system um, that is extremely wasteful and extremely ineffective. Now, whether that's a UBI, I think UBI is on paper theoretically ideal. Um, I also think it's politically very difficult. So yeah. I, I'd be also open to a negative income tax or maybe just taking SNAP, you know, food stamps, and saying, by the way, we're going to increase food stamps by like 500%, and now you can spend it on all these other things other than food, right? Those kind so, of incremental reform, I'm open-minded to anything that puts us in that direction. Yeah, the UBI thing, I'm all, I would say that I, I'm more on the negative income tax side mainly because – it, there's there's pros and cons on each side. Like I, the, the pro with UBI is this concept that it's very low administrative cost, and you can just send a check out to everyone. But actually, you know, I was actually pretty pretty leaning towards the UBI thing, and then I saw how COVID played out. Now I know COVID was paired with a massive uh, supply de- reduction, right? Because there were all these countries uh, companies that stopped producing products, and that drove up costs and all these other stuff. But I do think that when you um, when you give uh, a check to everyone, you effectively create an inflationary system where you're going to see prices go up across the board on many goods. And then I worry that it's just going to create a vicious cycle where you see the UBI needs to go up again, then prices go up again, and then inflation just kind of gets out of control. That's one of the reasons why I think negative income tax is more of a compelling idea, where if you're giving it to people that need it, it's used in different ways versus everyone gets a thousand dollars and then we all put it in game stock and you know what I mean? Like it's like the people that don't need it are throwing it into speculative investments. I, I'm curious as to how you uh, respond to that. And then I got another follow-up thought for you or another question. So, so that's a very common objection. Um, and I think that, I think that it's something that's very important for people to understand is that UBI and NIT are theoretical equivalents um, in many cases. So like there's a famous um, video from, uh, Harvard economist Greg Mankiw, um, which points out that a UBI of like $1,000 a month and a 30% flat tax on all income is basically the exact same thing as a $1,000 a month NIT with a 30 cents per dollar phase-out rate, like a 30% yeah. phase-out rate, and then a 30% flat tax on all the money that you make over the full phase-out of your basic income, right? Sure. Because basically what's happening is every time you earn a dollar, 30 cents is lost. Now, that 30 cents can either come directly out of that dollar in the form of a tax, or it can come out of your welfare check. But the reality is you're losing 30 cents for every dollar you gain, so you're only gaining 70 cents. And what really matters is the, the, the effect on your incentives. And so, um, honestly, like for me, I don't really care where the government's taking money from, um, you know, whether it's taking money from my welfare check or from my paycheck. I care about how much money I'm being left with at the end of the day. And that is what determines my incentive to do something. And so, so long as we think that people respond to taxes and welfare phase-outs the, sa- the same way, the only real difference between a UBI and an NIT would be the administration. Now, there's other there, – there, most econ bros will tell you UBI is theoretically more efficient because of the administrative reason, but sure. also because of – you could use alternative – like. Pagovian efficient taxes to fund it. And I agree with them, but I think that we should not get too far from political reality. And political reality is you're not going to eliminate all welfare programs tomorrow and replace it with a completely new program. But what you can do is you can make current welfare programs bigger while making other ones go away, the small ones, and you can make those programs more UBI or more NIT-like yeah. over time. And I will take progress over the current system. Yeah, I think it is it is completely politically unfeasible like to just assume that in one day you're going to pass a law that would abolish uh all the welfare systems and replace them with a UBI. So I think the phased approach doesn't make the most sense. Um I I think I would be a lot I would also be more interested in that NIT concept if it was something that you could get only if you maybe opted out of existing welfare programs so that you're not like double dipping. Because again, the major concern for me is government spending and we know so, that- So yeah, I, I have a whole proposal. So I have like very in-depth policy notes, but one idea could be for every $1 of another be- government benefit that you are receiving, um, excluding some like unemployment insurance and stuff like that, your uh, like NIT check or like modified food stamps check goes down by $1. So you just have a real incentive just to opt out of all these complicated benefits. Yeah. So you receive, you'll receive the same amount of benefit, but it will be through one program, which is easier for you. Yeah. Uh, there's other ways to, to go about it. Now, just to relate to your inflation point, because I didn't really address that. Um, 
as long as government spending is offset by taxation, you should not expect some huge inflationary effect. What happens is if you funded a UBI by the government borrowing enormous amounts of money, that would be an awful idea. That would be a terrible idea. Right. And it would cause tons of inflation. Uh, but I would hope, like, most of the people that advocate for UBI are not advocating for something that stupid. Maybe some MMTers are. But, but yeah. most, I hope most of them are not advocating for that. Well, I don't know how you would be able to afford it, though, because, I mean, like, you would have to do money printing, right? I mean, well, you would have to do massive federal spending, which would be money printing in consequence because of the cost of it, in order to roll it out today. Like, say, we, we decide to pass a law tomorrow. I mean, the government is running on serious, ridiculous deficits. It would really just drive that up without well i think i think you just need to you need to start thinking about all government phase outs for welfare as taxes right so right now if you're if you're really poor sometimes when you earn a dollar you actually lose more than a dollar in government benefits so you're facing like a hundred and ten percent tax rate yeah sure, right sure, effective sure. we call it effective marginal tax rates and so whenever you say i support an nit because it's more affordable many times what they're saying is well we're, we're, maybe, we're able to make like normal tax rates look lower by, ra by raising effective marginal tax rates on the poor. So instead of funding this, this basic income with like a 25% tax on all income, we're funding it with a 15% tax on most people's income and then like a 70% tax on the beneficiaries, on the first $25,000 of people's income. And like once you start thinking about welfare phase outs as just taxes, yeah. you start realizing okay, that that's actually a really bad proposal. Nobody yeah. would ever advocate for funding welfare with a 70% tax on poor people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I get your that, point. Yeah. Yeah, people do that inadvertently all the time when it comes to uh, welfare policy. Yeah, that's a really good point. And UBI solves that problem in a way. Uh, yeah, well, it makes sure that you like you're just now now all taxes are explicit. And most people understand that a 70% tax, explicit tax on poor people is a bad idea. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I've never heard it framed that way, but that makes a lot of sense when you put it that way. I, I, I think that's an interesting narrative. Um, okay, well, then we've got about 15 more minutes. Let's do two more um, on, the, on the, new liberal, uh, the new liberal kind of political vision. Let's talk about uh, maybe universal health care. So um, <clears throat> there's a lot of different proposals related to this one. So far as on one side, I've heard people say we should ban all private insurance and roll out a unit, you know, f basically federalize all insurance. I've heard a combination of both. But even within the universal health care model, there's a lot of different ways on how that's applied. What does uni universal health care mean to you? How, you know, what do you think an ideal solution would be in that regard? Do you support it or do you not? <clears throat> so this is like one of my pet issues because I find it so remarkably interesting. First, I want to give people just a basic lowdown of what the current healthcare system is. Most people understand that our healthcare system is Byzantine. It is complicated. We have like 15 different insurance systems. We have Medicare for old people. Medicare has two different parts of it. The government-run Medicare, the private-run Medicare, Medicare Advantage. We have uh, like three different healthcare systems for veterans. We have Veterans Affairs, but then we also allow veterans to get private insurance. Right? And then we have insurance that they can use at private providers, but it's government provided. We have insurance for the poor. We have insurance for poor kids. We have uh, individual insurance you can buy for yourself. And the majority of people are in insurance purchased by their employer. And then we have something like 10% of the population, which despite all these different insurance systems, doesn't have any insurance. Still, we, we didn't manage to get to them. So it's extraordinarily complicated. It, the administrative costs are simply enormous. It's inefficient. When employers control your health care, well, you're less likely to leave your current employer because that means leaving your health care, right? I'm a type 1 diabetic. If I had great insurance with a firm and I wanted to find a better job, it would be very difficult for me to just quit and go on a job search for three months knowing that my insulin, my test strips, my Omnipods, I would not have coverage for anymore unless I paid and it's there's a way you can extend it but it's very expensive and very hard right and so it's it's harmful in all respects now if you ask me what my view is i think that we've been given a lot of bad options um, i think a lot of people talk about building on obamacare obamacare made progress but it didn't tackle the fundamental complexity which is the sickness at the heart of our system Meanwhile, there's folks like Bernie Sanders, which have a slogan I really like, Medicare for all. Unfortunately, his proposal is almost nothing like normal Medicare. It's something completely different. 
People don't realize that 51% of people on Medicare today have private insurance. Medicare is not a government-run system. It is a government-regulated system that has a variety of options. I there's see. government Medicare, and there's private Medicare options that are financed by the government and regulated by the government on a marketplace. I think actual Medicare for all, I call it Medicare for everyone, uh, would be great because it's the simplest system. It gives people choice. You want government insurance? Go get it. You want private insurance? Go get it. And since it's so cheap, it would expand healthcare access. There's a lot of other things I would do as well, uh, but when it comes to insurance, I think that's probably uh, the best approach. Yeah. See, I, I I've been thinking about this a lot, and I personally don't have an issue with the concept of okay, the government is going to spin up a healthcare uh, health insurance option that you can opt into and pay, and I could see that even being part of maybe like a uh, you, know, you know, the libertarians would, would kill me for saying something like this, but where it was, you know, uh, subsidized for people on the lower income of the spectrum as a replacement for other alternatives. Um, one of the things that I found interesting was I had, we had Michael Cannon, who was the director of, I think he was the director of healthcare policy at the Cato Institute on the show a couple months ago. And he told me something that I did not realize that makes the American system unique. I mean, as you know, uh, if you're, you know, a political nerd, which you, you and I are, Cato Institute is very market-driven. They're a classical liberal libertarian think tank. Um, he spent a lot of time talking about how to return market forces to healthcare because, as I'm sure you know, the United States spends far more than its competition and gets poorer results. Um, if you look at, like, I think you've seen this, this, this chart of life expectancy versus healthcare spending, and the U.S. is this crazy outlier where we spend an obscene amount of money on healthcare relative to our competitors or, or you know, re significantly uh, similar countries. Um, but he told me that a lot of, like, for example, the, um, the, the health insurance through employer dynamic that we have in the United States goes back to the early 20th century with the income That's... tax, which I did not realize, where before there was even private health care options like what we have today, uh, the government basically said that, you know, if employers – provide, uh, what was the term he used? He said something like, um, it was basically like a, a health, it, it was like an insurance option at the time that we were thinking about more like life insurance or other types of insurance, then that would not be considered part of taxable, in taxable income. It's so they created this dynamic. Yeah. So they yeah. created this dynamic where once health, private health insurance came to market, it was just financially the most logical solution that you go with these these products because they created a market incentive for it. So his whole case, and he wrote this long book, I think it's called Recovery, which I thought was very interesting, was here's a set of policies that you could do to return market forces to healthcare so that private actor, like private individuals like you and I can understand what we're spending, where we're spending it. And I think that if you could do two things, you could try to find a way to return true market forces to healthcare in the private market, and then you could provide uh, an opt-in universal option where anyone could buy insurance from the government, you would solve a lot of problems. And there's a shit ton of policy proposals on the market side that would solve this, like buying insurance across state lines and things like that. But then on I, the other I don't know about that one, but I think, okay. yes, I like the idea. <laughs> sure. Um, he's got like, a, it's like a, a, you know, he's got a bunch of them in the book, but um, <laughs> you would be able to kind of have your cake and eat it too. You'd be able to have a more public option, um, that would be available to most people. It would give the government the uh, negotiating power to maybe drive down prices for drugs and things like that. And then you still have the private option that would uh, be lower cost rel you know, if market forces were truly there. Um, obviously, devil's in the details and all that, but I'm curious as to how you react to that, whether you feel the same way. Because I think the idea of banning private insurance is a really disastrous idea. Yeah, I, think so I, I, think that, I think people get confused um, in the healthcare discourse between the different aspects of healthcare, right? So there's providers, and like, do we have a market where people are shopping on where they go get their drugs? where they get their, uh, like their medical products, and which provider they go to, like which hospital you're going to go to, which doctors you're going to go to. I think there's a lot of market forces that can be injected there. I actually know that's the case uh, because that's what they do in Singapore, and that's one of the, reason, that's one of the ways they're p able to put a lid on costs. We also know that like plastic surgery, it's not exposed to insurance. It's basically a free market, and the cost for a lot of things goes down every year. 
even when you don't adjust for inflation sometimes, that is truly remarkable. And that just doesn't happen anywhere else in healthcare. So it's clear that there's a lot of things on the provider side that can be done to enhance competition. You can in, in eliminate certificate of need laws. You could expand the supply of physicians by ending the Medicare cap on funded residencies. I'm dropping tons of things that people probably don't understand. The point of the matter is though, like there's a lot of things the government can do to enhance competition in a marketplace on the provider side. But then there's a separate question of what do we do with insurance? And we do not need a free market for insurance uh, because the insurance market is defined by failures. Um, it is very um, difficult to, so suppose um, we were to drop all of the restrictions and regulations we have on insurance. Uh, the, um, it would be very difficult to actually shop between different health insurance options. Why? Because health insurance, those, those documents that, you know, what a health insurance policy is are incredibly long and incredibly dense. And simply nobody's going to be able to take the time to read not just one of those, but 20 of those and fully understand, or actually hopefully even more than that, and fully understand the nuances of every single one. So there needs to be standardization. Um, and also, if health insurers can discriminate against you based on your status of having pre-existing conditions, that means that the people who have conditions like I do will be charged way more than other people, which means in many cases, the folks who don't have insurance will be the folks who need insurance the most. And so you see that in all the healthcare systems around the world, um, there's these two things they do. They either have the government provide you insurance or they standardize the private insurance. And they make sure that there is some sort of mechanism in place that everybody gets insurance. You can achieve that through subsidies or what Obamacare tried to do, which is community rating plus subsidies. Basically saying, hey, if you have pre-existing conditions, we're not, we, insurers cannot charge you more. And the government will correct for that on the back end. My idea is that we have, like what Medicare has, we, we, con we consolidate the insurance system into one national system not 15. And then you basically have the government insurance completing on a level playing field with private insurances and all of it's paid for the, by the government. Everybody, we just pay for it by taxes. You can get an insurance policy. The policies are standardized and private insurers are able to try to add value, say, hey, we're more efficient than the government, so we're going to provide you more services. And if people want to provide you supplementary policies, extra coverage, you're always allowed to pay more. Um, I think that's probably the best approach. I, and I think that the one thing I would just say that maybe to some of your viewers is that if don't think that being pro-market means you must be pro lazy fair in healthcare. Because many times if you want a functional market in healthcare, you're going to have to be willing to accept some, some regulations which are just simply necessary for the market to work. Yeah, well, that is, uh, in a lot of ways, again, devil's in the details on that, but that is in a lot of ways where I think that kind of libertarian instinct of government bad falls apart because there is there is obviously a need, and not only just healthcare, but in any industry, to have rules of the game that are clearly established. And in some cases, that means smart regulation in order to make sure that, I mean, at the very minimum, monopolies don't form, right? Things like that that can really cause harm. Um, uh, but again, devil's in the details. I would say for the audience, and maybe you might be able to recommend them some stuff too, if you are interested in getting into the weeds on this, I really did enjoy Michael Cannon's book, Recovery, because there, he, he didn't just like talk about the problem for a long time and give some sort of half-baked solution. He basically went through like 100 pages of, hey, here's how you can basically return market signals back to the healthcare industry. And there were a lot of a lot of solutions there. Some of them may be better than others, and you, I defer to you as somebody who's spent a lot more time thinking about this than I have on that. Uh, but yeah, uh, <clears throat> if there's any, anywhere you think our audience should go, feel free to throw it out there. I want to go to one more issue before we run out of time. <clears throat> so I do have a newsletter, and a lot of that newsletter has been dedicated to the issue of healthcare. I understand that probably a lot of the things I've said are very dense, and it is because um, I don't want any nerds to watch this and be like, Mike had totally missed this thing and destroy me in the comments. I'm trying to protect myself. Um, but I ha if you go to my website, microirfan.com, uh, you'll see that I think I have a tab named Newsletter or Writings. It, once you hit that, you'll get to my Substack, and you'll see articles I've written that try to break down uh, issues and solutions in healthcare 
um, in a organized and as brief as possible fashion. They also link plenty of other resources uh, because I am not, this 20 year old is not the fountain of all wisdom. Um, so pl- make sure to read people other than myself who are often have, have more better insights than I do. Like it's a good rule of thumb in all things. So that's great. Um, all right, let's go to one more issue. This is one I've talked to the last couple of guests about. Um, I have seen a very unique phenomenon happening. It's actually, I've really only seen it in this election. I've never, I mean, I, I know this happens in every election, but I've seen this logic and rationale playing out now more than I've ever seen it. I know a lot of people that are in the kind of classical liberal camp, pro-market camp, even pro-limited government camp. I've seen Reagan Republicans in the same coalition. Basically, people coming to the table and saying, I'm voting for Joe Biden, even though I disagree with many of the things that he's doing. And it's been, uh, it's been interesting to me to see this play out. I actually didn't see this the same way in 2020 and definitely not in 2016. Um, but I had a, a woman on the show uh, last week uh, who her name's Sheikha Dalmia. She's the fa- she's the founder of the Unpopulist, and she she writes a lot about this. And she considers herself a very classical liberal person, limited government person, and she spelled this whole case out. And I know you're very loud and prominently um, pro Biden, but I know that you spend a lot of time talking to people of this political persuasion. I'm curious as to like what do you think is causing that? What brought you to that space? Because I know that there's things where you disagree with Biden, right? Um, but why, why do you think maybe this, this election is different or uh, why that coalition needs to be formed? Well, I think people are increasingly realizing that uh, the Republican Party of today is simply just nothing like uh, what the Republican Party was uh, 10 to 20 years ago, at least when it comes to their policy platform. I mean, we went from a Republican Party, which uh, avowedly was pro-markets, uh, to a Republican mar- party that is really concerned with imposing as many trade restrictions as possible. You know, Trump managed to start trade wars with countries you would never think we'd have trade wars with, right. uh, randomly tariffing uh, good friends of ours like the Germans and the Canadians and destroying one of the biggest trade agreements that had ever been bargained ever, uh, which was the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, renegotiating NAFTA for seemingly no reason. I, I know some people think that was a huge win. Almost nothing changed, except there was more restrictions put on more things. Um, And so that's just one category in which we are increasingly seeing that the Trumpist Republican Party just does not have the same economic stances they used to. And similarly, um, the Trump Republican Party has no respect for our institutions whatsoever. Um, You know, I don't know how authoritarian and bigoted and angry and anti-democracy somebody has to be before you could say, I agree with this person on all the issues, but I simply don't, I will not tolerate what they're going to do to our country. My father has officially crossed that threshold. He's been a Republican his entire life. Uh, And recently he told me, Micah, I can't vote for that man. He's a narcissist and a fascist. This is one of the best days of my life because... Even, let's say you, suppose you manage to find yourself in the unfortunate position of actually agreeing with Trump whenever he uh, does the insane things that he did. For instance, he he made it legal to leak methane into the atmosphere. That was one of his fantastic fantastic accomplishments. Um, Is it okay that he's trying to overturn elections? Is it okay uh, that he's talking about bloodbaths and how he loves Viktor Orban, a uh, famous dictator of Hungary? Is it okay that he seems to praise Kim Jong-un and Putin and invite uh, authoritarian foes across the, the world to invade our allies? Uh, there's simply, I think, a certain threshold of irresponsibility and um, I'd say moral ineptitude that I think Trump has, has managed to th- cross – uh, that has triggered so many people who are predisposed to agree with him uh, to simply abandon the project uh, because they have too much self-respect. Yeah, I mean, it says everything that he's got many of his prominent staffers in his former administration basically going out today and calling him a threat to democracy, which is crazy. Um, I, you know, one of the things, too, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, is I spent a lot of time talking to libertarians, and we, you talk about some of the policies he did related to climate change and free trade. Those are all big ones. But, I mean, in, from, like, a very traditionally libertarian perspective, he also, rege- like, outright rejects those things. I mean, like, gun control, he passed more gun control than any president in the last 30 years, you know. Uh, he ended transparency rules on drone strikes and set records of civilians killed in the Middle East. 
Um, it's not even – let's ignore the, the COVID stuff and then all the post-election stuff that you mentioned. I mean, it, it, that makes sense to me. So the question then is – I get the anti-Trump part. Uh, the pro Biden thing is it uh, for you a logic like uh, best chance to defeat Trump and then we get a, a shot to rethink the coalition? Like, are you really like really super pro Biden? Like, do you like a lot of the things he stands for? Like, where do you uh, where do you fall on that side? I, I genuinely think that we're in a fight against fascism right now. So, I mean, I honestly, we could put up we could put up um, you know a dead tortoise as our nominee, and I would be enthusiastic in, in, in encouraging people to vote for them. Now. Uh, with that being said, I actually think Joe Biden has been a good president. Um, I think relative to the past, um, think about a lot of these accomplishments, right? An infrastructure bill is no, no small feat. Uh, the Safer Communities Act, I know that you don't like gun control, but I do think um, temporary protective orders are important and they can save lives. Uh, you know, I'm a Texan. The Uvalde shooting uh, was done by a young man who was very clearly and obviously mentally disturbed to pretty much everybody around them. Uh, and if we had the correct policy in place, we could have easily said, hey, dude who just turned um, 18, you're not allowed to buy a gazillion firearms at this time. Um, and and uh, you, you've triggered some red flags, so we're going to take some basic t uh, protective measures, right? The, Joe Biden has had like almost an endless number of policy successes, and it's often the things that people don't recognize. Let me give you another example. Uh, we now have tax filing you could do with the IRS. Isn't that great? Now you don't have to pay a that tax filing service to file your taxes. This is incredibly common sense, and this is the kind of stuff that happens when you elect people who are actually competent and want to govern, not narcissist fascists. Yeah. Um, yeah. So go ahead. No, I was going to say, I think that it is indicative exactly right. As long as there's somebody on the other side that um, can at least stand for the peaceful transfer of power in America's institutions and not try to undermine them and literally, I mean, in Trump's words, turn himself into a dictator, I, I understand the reasoning, and it's the same kind of stuff that brought Chica who's a very limited government person, to Biden, who, again, my, my biggest criticism of Biden is his, his spending. Um, it is worth noting he reduced deficits, but a lot of that was due to the fact that there was so much spending during COVID. Uh, but I, I, I get it. I mean, I understand that logic, uh, as we've talked about before. I, I, to, 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 give, to give a little bit of clarity here, I would say that you know, I agree with Biden on um, – uh, you know, supporting NATO. I agree with Biden on a lot of these common sense policy agendas, trying to address climate change, uh, trying to the ch expanding the child tax credit. Many great things there. I'd say that many times Democrats fall prey to just bad policy design, and that would be my biggest criticisms of him uh, relating to domestic policy. You know, having a you know his approach to uh, student relief, I think, was inequitable and causes potentially a lot of inefficiencies with how the SAVE program is structured. And I think you see that with the Inflation Reduction Act. You know, we have still a kind of Byzantine system for tax credits for you know, green energy, right? These are the kind of things I'd levy criticisms on for, especially with taxes. Yep. Democrats don't have a great track record with taxes. But I think at a certain point, you have to be pragmatic. Yep. And uh, ultimately, it seems like Democrats are interested in doing good things. Um, and uh, Republicans are really interested in doing very bad things. And so insofar uh, that Democrats make mistakes, um, I think we try to help them be better. And one other thing I should note, the Biden White House released an extremely Yimby paper a little while ago talking about how, uh, I was sharing it around, the housing crisis is a crisis of supply. So don't underestimate how based Joe Biden is, even if he – and he said build, baby, build a little while ago too. So we got to give him credit for that. Yeah, well, and to close the loop on all this since we're at the hour, I will say that that in and of itself is why I think the new liberal, uh, just generally liberal movement, especially within the Democratic Party, is so incredibly important because if, if, if the next generation, people like yourself, can be successful in moving the Democrats towards – um, for towards more traditional liberal values, kind of drowning out the extremists, just like you know, uh, and keeping what happened on the right from happening on the left, bring us back to market forces. Really looking at re sound policy, we'll be better off, man. Uh, the hope is that we can make it through this election and not and have one in 2028 and uh, continue to build on that momentum. So I get the pragmatic argument. I understand. Jared um, Polis for president. Hey, listen, 2028. I'm a, I'm a Jared Polis stand. I like the guy a lot. Um, 
If you haven't looked, if you haven't, if for our audience, if you haven't checked out Jared Polis, governor of Colorado, you should look him up. He is a very market-driven liberal, um, which is a very, very good guy. Anything you want to plug? You plugged your website. You want to maybe plug that again? Is there any other? Oh, actually, I mean, are there any other questions, thoughts, concerns? Anything you want to throw at us before we close this out or just maybe plug? No, I just want to say, you know, I appreciate you, Josh. Um, I think that, you know, we agree on a lot of things. And I think as time has gone on, we've grown to agree more. Yeah. Um, we, di- we certainly come from different perspectives. Um, I am really happy there's kind of a movement of liberals coming around again because I think our ideas are correct. And I think that we need to like just put them out there. And when people learn about them, I think they realize um, how, how intuitive really many of them are. Um, in terms of plugging myself, microphone.com, all my links are there. That's why, that's why I made the website. Um, so just first and last dot com. And I look forward to maybe joining you sometime in the future. Awesome. Yeah, we'll have you back. So let me do our plugs and then we'll take us out. So if you're not familiar, Project Liberal, uh, projectliberal.org is a nonpartisan super PAC, and we were created for the goal of basically promoting liberal values in American politics. One of the things that we're going to be doing towards the end of the year is we're going to be launching one of our first major political campaigns. And um, and as part of that, it's going to be a members-led op- operation. So uh, our members, we have a committee, uh, and that member-elected uh, committee basically helps make some of those decisions on how we spend PAC money and make decisions to impact policy. So if you're interested in becoming a member, you go to projectliberal.org slash member. Um, and check out the website if you want to learn more. But, uh, yeah, you can follow us on Twitter at Project Liberal, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you again, Micah. It was a pleasure. I will see you again hopefully in the next couple weeks.